Hey, hello, and welcome back to another video. Today, we're looking at generics in Rust. If you're interested in how to write type and memory safe code without repeating yourself too often, then this episode might be for you. So let's get started right away. I've already executed Rustlings watch in the Rustlings repository, and we can see here that there is an error in exercises generics generics one.rs and here we see that there is a question mark in this type annotation for a vector so let's have a look at that file and see what's going on there so i'm going to open up exercises generics and then generics one.rs okay this is an easy one here we can see we have a function where we create a shopping list the shopping list is really just a vector and then we try to push an item in there and now you see here that this shopping list has an explicit type annotation of vector of something. And that something is the thing that we need to fill in here. You're probably also aware that we don't actually have to put this type annotation here. We can remove that. And then the compiler is going to be able to infer the type of this vector simply by seeing that the first item we're pushing into it is of type string slice. So then this thing here is automatically going to become a vec of string slice. Making this explicit here is going to make this code pass, I assume. Yep, that looks good. So now why are we doing this? This is really just an exercise to demonstrate the concept of generics. If you don't know what generics are, basically the idea is that with using generics, you allow your code to be reused for different types without actually writing the same code for different types. So in this particular case here, we have a vector of string slice. However, we probably also want to create a vector of i32 or a vector of strings or a vector of some custom structs that aren't actually native types. How do you make sure that you can have type safety when the type that's going to be used is not actually known at the time of writing the code? And this is what generics allow. And a vector turns out to be also just a type that is generic over some other types, namely the type of the items that are stored in that vector. We hope we're going to see in the next few exercises what that looks like when you define APIs that are generic. With that out of the way, let's move on to the next one. I'm going to remove that comment here and see what the compiler says this time. Okay, so now in generics 2.rs, we have some error here where there's some type being used, but a different type is being expected. And I'm just going to open up the file right away to see what's going on here. So generics 2.rs. All right, so there's a description that says, this powerful wrapper provides the ability to store a positive integer value. Rewrite it using generics so that it supports wrapping any type. So again, this is a good example of, of where generics can shine. So here we see we have a struct, it's a custom type, it's called wrapper, and it can hold a value of type u32. And then we see here that the wrapper struct comes with a method called new, which simply returns an instance of a wrapper. You see also here that the value has to be of type u32 as well, because the wrapper is created with a value and the value is of type u32. And then down here, we see that we're creating a wrapper using a value that is indeed of type u32. However, we have another test here that tries to create a wrapper, but this time with a value of type string slice. Now, obviously this is not compiling because the struct explicitly says that the value has to be of type u32. So if there was no thing such as generics, what we would need to do is basically take this wrapper and then create the same thing with a different type annotation. And we probably even have to call it a uh, string wrapper because otherwise we would have a conflict in naming. And we would have to do the same thing for the implementation blocks here as well as well as for any other type that we want to support with a wrapper struct like this. Now, obviously this is not really nice um, because it means we have to duplicate a lot of code and generics help us with exactly that issue. So what we need to do instead is saying, okay, so the struct wrapper is actually generic over some type and whatever that type is, is also the same type that the value has that it holds. Right now, at this point, it is considered generic. We don't know the concrete type 
that the wrapper is being used with at the moment of the definition of this struct. However, as soon as someone uses that API or this type in this particular case, the compiler is going to take all of the usages of that code and expands it to actual implementations. And then we have to do the same thing for the implementation block because here the value still says it has to be of type U32. However, we want it to work with any type. So I'm going to replace this with some type T. Also, by the way, T is really just a convention. You can use any letter that you want. It's just T is just short for type. But then in order to use T here to make it available in this method signature, we have to tell the compiler that it comes from somewhere. So we have to define the generic type here on the wrapper as well. And because theoretically this could be a concrete type as well, for example, U32, we have to make sure that Rust does not interpret this T here as a concrete type, but actually as a generic type. So the implementation block has to be generic over that type as well. So to recap, we say we have a wrapper that is generic over some type and the value that it holds is also generic over some type, namely the same type that the wrapper is generic over. And then the implementation block here applies to every wrapper of some type T, not just a wrapper of U32 or a wrapper of string, no, a wrapper of, of any type T that this wrapper is being used with. In this particular case, the wrapper type here and the new method is being used with a U32 type and a string slice type. So the compiler is actually gonna go ahead, take this code and then expands that into their dedicated types that they're used with. So you still have the complete type safety, but you don't have to write out every single implementation that is kind of similar, just the type's different. So let me save that and see what the compiler says. Okay, cool, this is working. I'm gonna remove the comment here and move on to the next one. Okay, next up we have a failing test in generics3. So let's open up that file, generics3.rs. And here we see a description that says, an imaginary magical school has a new report card generation system written in Rust, yay. Currently the system only supports creating report cards where the student's grade is represented numerically. However, the school also issues alphabetical grades and needs to be able to print both types of report cards. Make the necessary code changes in the struct report card and the implementation block to support alphabetical report cards. Change the grade in the second test to A plus to show that your changes are low alphabetical grades. Okay, so let's have a look here. We have our report card, which has a grade of F32 and then a student name and a student age. And then here we see it has a print method that returns a string and it says some student of some age achieved a grade of some grade. Okay, cool. And then down here we see that there is a test where we do create a report card and the grade is a value of type F, what was it, 32, correct. And then down here we see the same thing. However, we're supposed to change this grade to a plus. Now, obviously this is not gonna compile because grade has to be of type F32, but we want to leverage exactly the same struct with exactly the same implementation block. So we have to make it generic. Same thing as in the previous example, what we do is we say this report card is generic over some type T. And that same type is the type for the value of grade here. And then by doing that, we also need to make the implementation block here generic over some type T. And we probably think that that should do the trick. Let me save that and see what happens. Okay, so this is an interesting one. So now we see that the compiler is complaining that self grade in our print method is of type T and we don't actually know what type T is or the compiler doesn't know at this point because it can be anything really. And it says it cannot be formatted using the default formatter. What does that mean? So if we take a look at that function again, we see here that we use this format function and we use these placeholders here, these curly braces. And each of these placeholders here is replaced with the values that we supply this function with. So the third placeholder is replaced with the first value, the second placeholder is replaced with the second value, 
and the third one is replaced with a third value, which is our grade. And grade is of type T. So the compiler says, hey, wait a second, I'm trying to display this value of whatever type it is. But because I don't know what type it is, I don't actually know whether I know how to render it, how to display it. So again, if grade is actually of type some custom struct, the compiler wouldn't know how to display that struct here. So we have to make sure that grade is generic over some type T, but that type T has to have some certain functionality. It has to implement APIs so that the compiler can render the value. And this is what we can achieve with traits. If you don't know what traits are, they're kind of like interfaces in other languages. And there is a trait for displaying values. It's called the display trait. We can actually import it here by saying use standard library formatting module and then display. Now by having that trait in here, we can actually make use of that. Normally when we would implement custom types, we can also make sure that these custom types implement traits like the display trait. And if they do, then they can be printed by the format macro, just like we do down here. Now, by having traits, we can actually make use of a feature called trait bounds in which APIs expect a generic type, but the type is bound to particular traits. So in this case here, for example, we want to say, okay, we have an implementation block for report card, which is generic over some type T, but T cannot just be any type. It has to be any type that has a display trait bound. So now the compiler sees that T has to be any value that implements the display trait. If the value isn't of a type that implements the display trait, then the code is not going to compile. And that ensures that this function is always going to work when the code compiles. So let me save this and check out the compiler. And this is compiling. Wonderful. Okay. Going to remove the comment and moving on to the next one. And that was a little introduction to generics and traits and trait bounds in Rust. I know this is just scratching the surface. I'm going to create another video in the future that talks a little bit more in depth about traits and generics in Rust. Thanks for tuning in and make sure to check out the other videos as well.